As much as the Fed says it will pay attention to the data, the markets, the markets got the message that they shouldn't expect any relief from tightening anytime soon, as the S&P 500 was down just over 4% for the week, and over three of that came on Friday alone in response to Chair Powell. The Nasdaq fared even worse, down 4.4%, and again, almost four of that came on Friday alone. The bond market was a bit more complicated, with the yield on the 10-year up to just over 3%, barely up for the week. But the yield on the two-year reacted much more to the Fed news, ending the week at 3.4. That's up 16 basis points for the week. To help us understand what the markets are trying to tell us, we welcome now Peter Kraus. He's founder, chairman, and CEO of Aperture Investors, and Lizanne Saunders, chief investment strategist for Charles Schwab. So, Lizanne, give us your take on what happened here. If the markets were expecting more of the same, they sure, sure didn't react that way. Well, I think, you know, the narrative around the basis for the rally that started uh, in mid-June, some of it had to do with the uh, the peak in the 10-year at around 3.5%. But this narrative that was created around the notion of a Fed pivot, uh, we never bought into that narrative. I think a pause is something we should talk about at some point, as did Powell today. But a pivot to aggressive rate cuts as early as the beginning of next year that the only reason the Fed would have the green light to do that would be a significant deterioration in the labor market from here and or a much more significant deterioration in the economy. And, and for now, we haven't seen that. So it wasn't a surprise to see him really forcefully push back against the, the, the idea of a pivot, that once they get to whatever the sort of final hike is, they're going to stay there for a while. And I think the market had trouble digesting that. So, Peter, if you look at the markets, they haven't entirely given up on that cut next year. They backed off of it some after the power remarks, but not in, well, 100 percent. Were you surprised at the market reaction? No, I, I wasn't. I, I was a little surprised with August's uh, gains. I mean, it was really sort of a melt up. It sort of persistently was a risk on type of market. And as Lizanne said, there really wasn't any reason to believe that Powell was going to somehow give some credence to the idea that the Fed was about to reduce rates in the next six months. So I think the market sort of just realized that it was rising in a, at a level that was not sustainable given where interest rates are likely to go. And we haven't really seen enough economic weakness to signal that rates are going to modify. So the market reacted to that. And I suspect it may follow through with more of a reaction until we get into September and there's real volume and real players in the marketplace. And right now, we're still in a very, very thinly traded market. Uh, Peter, uh, if, the, if the Fed was trying to get out of the business of really affecting the markets, it's not succeeding very much. I mean, obviously, the central banks around the world really got involved a lot, starting with the great financial crisis. And some people thought they were trying to pull out of it, including with the balance sheet rundown. But right now, how much of this is just driven by the central banks themselves, Peter? Well, we have not seen a return to fundamental investing. We're still in markets that are captivated by headline risks and headline commentary, whether it's the Fed or whether it's the Russia-Ukraine war or whether it's China's COVID policies. Uh, we're still being driven by headlines and not enough fundamental analysis. I suspect that we're going to come to a market where fundamental analysis will have much more of an impact on what investors actually invest in. But we're going to have to get to some level of the bottom here. And I, I don't think the market's quite there yet, but it's forming a bottom. So, so Liz, and one of the things that Peter just mentioned actually was liquidity. Uh, to what extent is that pay, playing a significant role right now in what we're seeing in the markets? Well, there's the short-term impact simply of just light volumes by virtue of it being August. And I think Peter's right about that. but. You know, we, we've basically done a 180 in the liquidity environment with the Fed having gone in the past year from 0% interest rate policy, ballooning the balance sheet to $9 trillion, and now starting that process in reverse, uh, not to mention the fact that so much um, liquidity has moved away from the traditionally liquid markets into less liquid markets. And at a point in time, possibly, where there is that need for more ample liquidity, I think that has the potential to be a, a future strain. I, I, I also think that, that Peter's absolutely right. This has been more macro-driven, not fundamentally driven, certainly not the unbelievably low quality bias to where some of the speculative juices were, were running most hot in this rally from mid-June 
to mid-August, but we're also dealing with, uh, you know, you know, I like David to sort of channel the old days on Wall Street Week, and and my first 13 years in the business, starting in the mid 80s, was working for the late great Marty Zweig, who coined the f- phrase "Don't fight the Fed," and I I think Powell's underlying message today was, "Hey." Don't fight us. <laughs> yeah, that's really right. You were an important part of that Wall Street Week, I must say, back in the day. But listen, let's pick up on one thing, and that's credit, because uh, we really haven't seen credit spreads blow out, blow out yet. Should we expect that coming? So we we did see a uh, maybe not a blowout, because it depends on how you define that term, but we did see a, a pretty significant move up in spreads, and then they retreated a bit in conjunction with the rally in the equity market. But that contributed to a loosening in financial conditions, which maybe not as explicitly focused on today by Powell. That was another thing I think they needed to and are starting to push back on is this loosening of financial conditions. And I know we had our conversation earlier today, and Peter has thoughts that I think we're not out of the woods, certainly from a from a credit environment. There's a lot of of low quality zombie companies out there that probably are going to face some some growing pressure. Yeah, I mean, as Lizanne points out, we, we have interest rates that are two times what they were six months ago. And while there may not be a maturity wall that we're facing, because many companies have been able to refinance in the last 18 months, that's not entirely true for the commercial real estate market, number one, and it's not true for every company. And so as we continue to see a slower economy and less revenues and more pressure on on cash flow, I suspect that we will see some credit widening and we will see some stress in the credit markets and that hasn't really happened yet and one other issue on liquidity we talk about liquidity as it relates to the fed we also have to talk about liquidity as it relates to the actual trading markets that credit lives in the trading markets that credit lives in have been very thin very illiquid and create significant gap risk and that is going to continue and i don't see that changing in any short period of time Listen, I wonder, does the rise of private credit contribute to some of the lack of liquidity, the thinness in the market, some of the opacity? Uh, I think absolutely. I think we've taken for granted for much of the past 15 years or so in the aftermath of the global financial crisis with the Fed going to zero interest rates and starting multiple rounds of, of QE. And I think we've been in this environment where liquidity was so ample that we didn't worry about uh, that. Uh, I think we're now entering a part of the cycle where we're going to find that we probably should have had a bit more of a cushion. 